Richard Kuklinski, a contract killer known as the Iceman, is serving multiple life sentences for over a hundred murders. He freely admits to the brutal, cold-blooded killings. But one question remains unanswered. Why? Did you think of yourself as an assassin? Assassin? Sounds so exotic. <laughs> I was just a murderer. In July 2002, Dr. Park Dietz, a world-renowned psychiatrist and consultant to the FBI, visited Kuklinski in search of an insight into his twisted criminal mind. Over the course of four days, Dr. Dietz spent 13 hours with him, trying to penetrate the psyche of this remorseless killer. If I understand you correctly, you're positive you killed more than 50 people and Definitely. you think you probably killed more than 100 people. Definitely. You sure of that one? Definitely. But not sure it's more than 200. I wouldn't say definitely to that. Maybe yes, maybe no. I would say less than 200 people. Well, you tell me. It's not less than 200 people. You killed more than 200 people. Sure. Yep. I killed, basically, more 100 people when I was a young man, before I even knew anybody. Too much. <sighs> One part of my life, I killed people for nothing. Just for somebody to look at me wrong, I would kill them, stab them, Shoot them. You tended to shoot people up close and personal. Definitely. I wanted to tell them just before they left. I wanted to say goodbye. Did you like to look them in the eye? I wanted them looking straight at me. This was a long way away, the distance we are now. We were closer. What did you want him to think as they died? Just see my pretty face. I take it to them. But the last thing they ever saw was me. And if they carry that glimpse to eternity, infinity, or whatever it is, they're going to be thinking of me all that time. I'd be looking in their eyes. I would see the blankness come over it. I'd watch them die. I just didn't shoot them and walk away. I saw the surprise, the shock, the blank. They're gone. And all I saw was my reflection. But that's it. Did you have a favorite place you'd like to shoot? A favorite? Well, most of the time, if you're up close, you shoot them under the chin. You would shoot them. Shot a guy one time in his uh, Adam's apple. See how long it would take him to die. How long did it take? A few minutes. He drowned, actually. He didn't. Drowned in his blood? Mm hmm. I was with somebody else. We had a $50 bet. I lost. You thought he'd go faster, huh? Yes. Do you know what an adrenaline rush feels like? Oh, yeah. What will give you one? Sex. It's the only one. I don't really get anything from hitting anybody, hurting anybody, shooting anybody. It does nothing for me. 
You know, the internet to bring gives me pleasure of sex. Well, that's a different kind of pleasure than what an adrenaline rush is. pleasure, I guess. Yeah. If I were to beat somebody up, it would do nothing for me. If I knocked them down and stepped over them, that's why, you see, it doesn't bother me. I don't care to hurt anybody. It does nothing for me, killing someone else. But you could never get a feeling out of it. I never got one, though. It was disappointing. That's when I figured I must be crazy. Because I figured some of them should have some kind of a feeling. Something. Dr. Dietz discovered that by the age of 10, Richard Kuklinski was already showing signs of pathological behavior. How were you with animals at that age? Deadly. Cats, dogs? Cats, dogs. I used to tie two cats' tails together. I'd throw them over a clothesline and watch them rip each other apart. How long does it take? Not long. Did they both die? I don't know. I never stood around to see if the final thing. <clears throat> I would say uh, eventually they both died because they were both pretty well tore up. It's got to be noisy. It was quite noisy. What else would you do with cats? Well, we had the incinerator in the projects there. So I threw a cat in the incinerator. Then I threw a book of matches in there. And through the door, I watched the fire get bigger and bigger, and this cat was running around, trying to get away. Eventually, the fire got too big for him, and he didn't run anymore. Kuklinski's childhood was characterized by brutality and violence inflicted upon him by his father, Stanley. What's the worst beating you ever took from your old man? <laughs> I don't think there's much difference in any of them. They were all pretty bad. He uh, left his mark on me, pretty much. And he did most of that before you were, what, 11? Yes, I was young. And was that worse when he was drinking? With Stanley, it didn't really matter whether he was drinking or he wasn't drinking. He was a nasty son of a bitch, and he always will be until the day he died. And he, when he died, he was a nasty son of a gun. Did you go to his funeral? No, I didn't. Was there one? Yes. I didn't like him in life. Why would I want to go see him in death? I was glad he was dead. How about your mom? How was she? Over the years, I got to dislike my mother a great deal. But now that I have more time to think about it, she was just a victim of her own life. As a kid, how did you see her? Hateful. Disliked her a great deal. She didn't believe in uh, sparing a rod either. I mean, she used to hit me with a uh, broomstick if I did something wrong. Where would she hit you? Wherever it hit. As Kuklinski grew older, he no longer had to suffer his father's brutality. Instead, he chose to inflict his own on others, often for little or no apparent reason. How much would somebody have to humiliate you before you'd become obsessed with killing them? It would, it would be the degree he, he humiliated me. If it were not much, and it would be the time. It would be how my attitude was. If I was jumpy or edgy, it wouldn't take much. If I was passive, then uh, he, he might get away with it. But 
No one really knew. I took a guy down one time, just following him around. He was with a few people. Now, as they went to the bar, this person decided he couldn't wait to get inside to urinate. He never did. Everybody else went in. He stayed outside to urinate. He urinated. Uh, he went comfortably anyway. He had an empty bladder. But I actually strangled him. From behind, I assume. Definitely. I actually did it in a way that's maybe, maybe this is original. And maybe not, I don't know. But I uh, put the rope around his neck, twisted it, <clears throat> and threw him over my shoulder and held him there. So actually, he, I was the tree hanging him. Yeah. And he eventually just stopped kicking. And I let it loose at one end. He slid down to the ground. I put him over by the garbage and uh, left. Had you brought a length of rope with you? No, actually, I. <laughs> it, um, this guy. Um, these people had a. Um, uh, around the back at a bar, they must have lived upstairs. There was a pot upstairs, and they had one of these things where they had rope across this thing, and they had a couple of these lines going across this way, and that's what I took. Talking about clothesline? Yeah. Now, what did this guy done to you? I didn't like him. He just made me mad for some, some reason or other. For me to track him and wait for him, I was mad at him for something. Do you remember what his body did while you were hanging him? Yeah, I was twitching and kicking. How long did it take? I don't really know. Didn't look at my watch, so I really couldn't say. You know, I kept him a while. Even after he stopped, I kept him a while just to make sure. Did you have another weapon with you? Yes. But this was quieter. It was more personal. I actually felt him die. Did you like that? Didn't do anything. But I, I mean, I did feel him die. I felt him go limp. And you got your relief? Yes. Basically, I didn't have any more pressure, no more tension. It was, it was almost like a cure-all. <laughs> Unbelievable. From an early age, Kuklinski had an uncontrollable temper. If he had a problem, he solved it the only way he knew how. I was driving in Georgia one time, and we were riding down the road, and there was a couple of vans running around, and they were hooping and hollering there. I guess they were having a good old time and maybe drinking and whatnot. They decided, I guess it was interesting to play with a guy from New Jersey and they started to click clack and with their vans and push me here and push me there off the road and they were running in and out and what their problem was I really don't know never did know but uh, it came to a point where um, I got extremely mad about that and uh, but it was silly of me because I was away from home I had no backing I had no problem I only had one weapon which was in the trunk which was a 357 with a hair trigger so I stopped the car and got out opened the trunk I had the release in the went in the trunk and took the 357 and just stood there. Now, apparently their eyesight mustn't be too good because I don't think I'd walk up on a guy with a 357 standing by his side. But these fellas did. Foolish mistake. They all died. And 
I didn't even know them. How many? There was a few of them. I reloaded. Killed every last one of them. Yeah. And that wasn't even one I wanted to do. Do you think that what they did was a capital offense? What they did? You mean playing with me? Yeah. Well, they could have killed me. Well, they ran me off the road and I died. Bad behavior, no argument. Reckless endangerment. Reckless driving, host of bad things. Is it a capital offense they committed against you? Apparently. I did kill them. So to me, it must have been. Because when I had come to that point, and that point, that is the last point they come to. I don't back off once I go forward. Once I go forward and I take a gun, I do not back off. I didn't know how many they had. I didn't know what they had. They could have had guns. They could have had anything. They wanted to play with me. I didn't want to play. So we didn't play no more. And I would have taken whatever came. You almost made me mad. I know. What made you mad about that? I don't know, but you almost did. Can you figure out what it is? No. Try to look at it. Look at what made you mad there. I don't know. I think it must have been something you said. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, but I don't know what it was. Could it be that I was challenging you and it sounded judgmental? Could be. Hmm. Yeah, it could be. Because you've got me annoyed with you now. Yeah. That's the truth. How mad are you? I bet. Pretty. I feel a little flushed. So that means that I've reached a point in my life that I'm a little annoyed. What would you like to do? Doesn't matter. I don't think it's gone to the point that I'm actually going to do anything stupid. I'm just uh, curious to myself why it, why it happened. I don't know why it happened. I'm... I'm Actually, almost glad it did happen because you had a chance to see something. But I don't know why, it's, why it happened. Did you feel I was criticizing you? Yes. Is that what did it? I think so. I think that's the part that did it. Who used to criticize you the most? Of course, my father. Yeah. Kuklinski's efficient, remorseless killings came to the attention of the Mafia and in his 20s, he graduated from the random, impulsive murders of his youth to a new career as a contract killer. He recalls his first murder for hire. He gave me a picture of him and um, a description of what he does and what he generally does and where he goes, places he goes. And uh, so I went to the area where they said he might be, and uh, I saw somebody who looked like him, similar to him. He had a knack for smoking, and they told me he smoked big cigars, Churchill cigars or something. So I uh, pulled up alongside of him. At the time, I was riding a motorcycle. And I just said, uh, Cuban, Ali Cuban, looks like a good cigar. And he wasn't a happy camper, because he said, fuck you. <laughs> and I, when he said, fuck you, he looked my way, and I got a clear shot of his face. It was a picture I had of the man they wanted. And uh, I said, nah, don't fuck me, fuck you. And I just took this weapon out and blew his head off. 
just disintegrated is uh, like you see a pump can get hit with a shotgun or something they just poof, spread out and that's what happened and I light turned green about the time I shot him and I left does it give you any response in your guts to see a man's head explode it surprised me a lot a response in my gut what kind of response do you want I don't know. I don't have any response. Most people, when they see horrible things, if they see somebody badly injured, certainly see something that awful, have a visceral reaction. They feel nauseated. They may want to vomit. Mm. It makes them very uncomfortable all over real fast. Mm. Did you get anything? No, it's a good thing I didn't have to vomit because then I would have had real problems on that motorcycle. But I didn't have that problem. I didn't have any sickness, dizziness, or upset stomach or anything like that. It helped you adapt and cope not to care. Definitely. Not to care is much better. Because it's a weakness to care. That's right, it is. When you care, you can't just move. You have to worry. And you got something to lose. That's right. By the late 60s, the Iceman had become one of the mob's most prolific contract killers. Some of his most brutal murders took place at the Gemini Lounge in Brooklyn, a favorite haunt of mafia men. dismembering bodies, did that turn your stomach? I don't think so. I remember having pizza one day while we were doing something like that. Pizza in one hand, chainsaw in the other? No. <clears throat> I didn't like chainsaws. That's another fable that they've come up with that I use chainsaws. In. See, chainsaws are messy. Yep. All you get is little all over me, I have these little pieces of meat. Now, that's a pain in the neck if I use chainsaws. Now, would I want to ruin a good shirt with a chainsaw? That would be downright stupid. And I definitely have the wrong. I don't think I could walk around with bits of meat hanging off me or bits and pieces of somebody's body hanging off me. I would probably smell a little bit bad also at that point. So what's a better way to dismember Just a body? Just a knife. A butcher knife, you know, you cut it around the bone and a little slice here, a little slice there. And wrap it, ship it. Do you understand that most people can't imagine doing that to a human? Sure. I can understand that a great deal. I can't understand why I can. Did you have to cultivate that ability, or is that natural for you? I don't know. I don't recall. I did it. I don't recall when I started doing it, or why, or the feeling I had when I did it. I don't know. Jeffrey Dahmer told me that when he cut well, bodies it. apart, yeah. it repelled him. He found it horrible. He had to get himself drunk to overcome that Stink. natural revulsion. Yeah. It's because it's disgusting. Yes, it is. But to you, you could just do it. No feeling. No. The smell sometimes was uh, annoying, but I would put cologne on. I would generally put cologne across here so I could smell the cologne a lot better than I could smell anything else. Shooting. Stabbing. Strangulation even poisoning, all part of Richard Kuklinski's murderous repertoire. He sometimes froze his victims' bodies to disguise their time of death, earning him the name of Iceman. In his sessions with psychiatrist Dr. Dietz, 
he revealed that some of his clients wanted his victims to suffer before they died. Of course, Kuklinski obliged, creating the kind of death nightmares are made of, often capturing the torture on film. I used to have a thing where I would take somebody into a cavern or cave, whatever you want to call it, and I would uh, <laughs> I would tie them up or tape them, their hands and their um, feet together, and um, then I would leave them there, and I'd leave a camera on. And um, rats used to eat them. Rats used to kill these people. It was a very painful death for these people because uh, rats would. Uh, eventually smell them or come near them and and uh, start nibbling away at them the people would definitely scream and yell and holler and try to get away and uh, eventually more rats would come and they would uh, consume these people eventually you know, but there was a lot of screaming and yelling in between. But when I did that and I watched it on the devil was that super eight, I think it was. Uh, I found it uh, distasteful and it used to make me nervous for some reason. I said that was some type of uh, a feeling which I wasn't too keen on having. But I did it because it gave me a feeling of some kind, and therefore I was trying to find out what it was that was giving me some type of feeling. Whether it was the, the horror of what was going on, or the screaming that was happening, or just the nastiness of it. But I never figured it out. But I did that quite a few times, too. Maybe too many times. And watched it? Yes. I beat a guy at that one time. I had blood in my shoes. His blood in my shoes. It just goes on that way. I had to throw all my clothes away. You know, I was driving a big Lincoln Town car with butt naked. <laughs> Has she wrapped around me? <laughs> We're having too much fun, you know. You realize that? I'm coming across like a nice guy. Mr. Nobody's gonna believe this. Nobody. I wouldn't believe this if I was watching this. Because I'm the furthest thing from a nice guy. I am what you call a person's nightmare because of the way I project myself people think they can get by and then all of a sudden when they wake up it's too late they already hit the stop sign and that's a dead stop There have been people you've been good to, Arthur. Not many. There have been people. I don't know what you consider good. I, your interpretation of good might be different than mine. I don't know. What do you mean good? Well, how do you think you were with your kids? Oh, the kids. Now you're talking completely different. Now you're talking black and white. There was nothing I wouldn't do for my, my children. Nothing. 
I'd kill everybody in this room for them. That's just to show you a point. Not that I would or want to, I'm just saying I would. If it meant I had to for them, I would do it without even thinking twice. It might upset me, it might hurt me, but I would do it. Does that answer your question? To a point, but then you're not sure. All right. Who else were you good with? Good with? There aren't many people I was good with. It was only in my family. I would, it was good to my family. And even those people I hurt. How? Just by being there. I was a nasty son of a gun. I am a nasty son of a gun. What, what would happen at home? You name it. Violence, I think they call it domestic violence. Yes, I've called it at all. There's nothing I haven't done and nothing she hasn't put up with. I'm not proud of it. That's the way it is. I could say I'm sorry, what good would it do? I couldn't have been too sorry, I did it again. But yet I was sorry. I couldn't control it. It's one of those things. Couldn't control it. I found something I couldn't control. Almost a hate love. Hate love. Relationship. So I really liked, loved the girl. But when I got mad, I forgot all that and wound up hurting the person I loved. So where did I really love her? I still hurt her. I got to trust her more than I trusted anybody in my whole life. She's the only person I ever really trusted. Only once did the Iceman put his faith and his fate in the hands of another. I believe I attempted her to do it. I, I gave her a knife and told her, here, here's a chance you'll never get again, or something like that. And I turned around. Now she had a chance. She didn't do anything, she dropped the on the floor and uh, walked away. And I left the house. There was a stabbing between your parents, wasn't there? Yes, there was. What room was that in? I don't remember. What I happened? I don't remember. I don't know, Stanley uh, stabbed uh, Anna. Which, why, I don't recall. I don't remember what it was all about, but I remember it did happen, yeah. Stabbed her in the back? My, uh, yeah. And here you are inviting Barbara to do that to you. Stupid, wasn't it? Yeah, but I did. Were yeah, it's you, true. Were you testing her? You were trying to, uh, I don't know, it might have been. I may have, would have been a powerful thing if she... <laughs> If I was wrong, <laughs> yeah. I definitely would have got the point. <laughs> Told you you had a sense of humor. I know you did. That's why I treated it, didn't I? But it's not a joking matter. It's a very serious thing. Domestic violence is very serious. It's, I believe that's probably why uh, my daughter dislikes me a great deal. Probably because she lived through a lot. You know, she didn't live through it all. Heard it, saw it. Saw it. Everything. It's Psychologically, I just probably hurt them in some way. Because they have that in their mind. As I have things in my mind. Why did you decide to talk to me? Well, basically, I think I tried it. I decided to talk to you was, would be so I could find out more about myself, since I don't know the answers. Uh, and you are a person who is highly qualified to give me answers, possibly, of what's going on. I figured 
this would be a good time to talk to somebody like you or you, you know. Well, why don't we turn the tables here and you interview me? I'll answer your questions. Interesting. I can live with that. Just so happens I might have a question for you. Hmm. <laughs> what do you think about me? Anything good, bad, or indifferent? Yeah, some of each. <laughs> the, um, the issues about your behavior, I think there are really a couple things to say. The things that I'm most sure of, based on the information you've told me, are that your principal problem has been a warp in your personality. And we classify personality according to different types. And there are two types of personality features that you have a great deal of. The first of them is called antisocial personality disorder. What it refers to behaviorally is someone who does not have a conscience, does not have remorse, does not feel a sense of guilt about most of the bad things they do, is impulsive and violent. Uh, the typical things we see before age 15 in people who earn that label are cruelty toward animals, cruelty toward people, and an awfully interesting part of that condition is that uh, we've got a little bit of knowledge of what causes it and where it comes from. And that's where there's some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that part of where that comes from is hereditary. That there's a genetic basis to being a fearless person. And You've told me about how rarely you have any experience that even begins to resemble nervousness or fear. It takes extreme things to make you have a sense of impending danger. Normal people get fearful about a wide variety of things frequently and would be uh, beside themselves with the kinds of experiences that you had on a weekly basis. You couldn't have done the things you did if you were capable of ordinary fear. But the fact that you're born with a genetic predisposition to fearlessness doesn't mean that it's inevitable for you to become a criminal. Because some people who have that genetic predisposition to fearlessness become pro-social risk takers. They do things like uh, drive race cars, uh, test fly planes, fighter pilots, bomb disposal technicians. Now those are all jobs where it helps to have a lot of fearlessness. And in fact, some people in law enforcement are brave and have that same capacity to be fearless. And the difference between the people who grow up to be risk-taking good guys with white hats and the people who grow up to be risk-taking bad guys with a long, long rap sheet and a lot of crimes has to do with how their parents raise them. If you raise a kid with love and kindness and affection most of the time, you've got a good shot at their growing up to be decent, caring, loving human beings and treating their own kids well. But if you raise a kid the way Stanley raised you, with no love, no affection, constant abuse, beatings for no reason, all you teach is hatred. 
you make it impossible for that child to grow up and form strong attachments and loving, caring relationships, or to be willing to risk themselves to protect the world. So I think you got to be this kind of antisocial, psychopathic person, both by getting Stanley's genes and having Stanley's parenting and your mother's cold, standoffish way of treating you. In other words, that part of you was both born and made. But your own kids and your own grandchildren will turn out according to how you and Barbara raised them, despite whatever genetic influence there may be. You killed more than 200 people. Sure. Yep. Having spoken at length to Iceman Richard Kuklinski about his life as a contract killer, psychiatrist Dr. Park Dietz gives his analysis of what drove Kuklinski to kill so many times without guilt or fear. The other thing that I think is true about you is another personality style where I think it's fair to say that you've got the features of what we call a paranoid personality disorder. The general rule for someone who is paranoid is to trust no one, let no one get too close to you, and to never forgive anyone who does you wrong. If somebody criticizes them, they're quick to respond with anger or to counterattack. If somebody humiliates them, then they must have revenge. About one to two percent of the population has the paranoid personality disorder. About two to three percent of males and one percent of females have the antisocial personality disorder. And then there's a smaller group that has both. And it was having both that allows you to have this career that you've had and that allowed you to profit from your capacity for a completely emotionless, fearless, remorseless hit by being free of any conscience and also free of friends and of people who could bring you down you were able to have a very long run as a successful contract killer, which is quite unusual. And you wouldn't have been able to do that had you not had both of those personality flaws in your line of work that turned out to be major advantages, kind of preconditions for a successful career. I appreciate uh, you taking the time and explaining this to me. I am probably the loneliest person in the world because I have nothing I care for and I can't make any friends to have any kind of a relationship or... So I've lost everything. I've lost everything I ever cared for, everything I ever wanted. It's down the toilet. Since there is no love in my life, I must have something to replace it, so I replace it with hate. Constant hate. Constant reminder to hate. And what's that do for you? Keeps my left foot going in front of my right foot. Keeps me moving. Without it, I would probably just plop down someplace and have no reason to continue. Is that all you've got left is hate? That's all I've got left. Everything that I ever cared for is gone. Everything I ever liked is gone. Everything I that meant anything to me is gone. So hate. That's all you started with too. Then I've come full circle. It's time for me to die.
Now and five, time for you to pick up the phone and try to win some cash in the great big British quiz. <laughs>